Shall we take a look at the list of shit, Marsh? That, uh, that they've tried to diagnose, that they've said, well, this is, you know, we think this is what you've got. This is what the antibody tests show. This is what all the different things show. Uh, maybe that's that's not good enough. I don't know. Uh, let me let me just pull up my little copy here to sh to read along. Let's uh, let's see what we've got here, Mersh. As we go, we'll start. You know, we'll 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 start. Oops, hold on one second here. Sorry, chat. I'm getting everything ready to read. Uh, in the upper right, uh, cutaneous B cell lymphoma. It sounds like cancer, Mersh. Hashimoto's hypertension, retrieval artery dissection, pulmonary nodules, congenital spinal stenosis of the lumbar region, sensorineural hearing loss of the right ear with unrestricted hearing of the left ear, immunoglobin subclass deficiency, long-term use of systemic steroids, osteoporosis with pathological fractures, uh, precure, I can't even say that, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, coronary artery disease involving native coronary artery of native heart with angiopectoris, or I'm sorry, without angiopectoris, type 2 diabetes mellitus without complications, uh, a result of the steroids, fun, controlled substance agreement, that's for all the pain, Mersh, uh, cushoid side effect of steroids, that's when your face turns into the moon, inflammatory arthritis, nice way of saying rheumatoid, absence of sensation, anxiety, yeah, I got a little anxious as this was going on, as my hellscape continued, kidney stones, migraines, congenital dilation of aorta, and disorder of the pituitary uh, gland. You know, just a few things, Mersh, I'm dealing with over here. Just really committed, really committed to the lie. I put a lot of effort into this. I, I, I put a lot of effort into this, Mersh. <laughs> you know, uh, Mr. Munchausen's going in there tricking those doctors. Tricking all those doctors, Mersh. Uh, let's see. What, what else can I show for a little Mershy poo here? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, Jim, you know, it's, it's just faking everything. Let's look at some actual test results. Here's fun. Here, you know, this is when I learned that I was starting to fracture, you know, just ribs in my spine by itself. Uh, this was the whole body PET scan that they did on me, which again, oh God, it sounds like he's saying PET CT findings, uh, residual mildly FDG, avid soft tissue, stranding, thickening in the right posterior scalp. Oh boy. Sounds like cancer, dipshit. Why was I going in again? What was the, what was the, the, the reason that they were sending me in? Oh, subsequent treatment planning and restaging for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Oh, and then what's that secondary thing they saw there? Oh, the uptake from the fucking uh, uh, sugar dye they put in me that showed that I had a fucking busted couple of ribs that nobody knew about because they were all. And what was that? What was the date of that? That was, that was uh, January, February, March, April. That was May, May of 2023 when they did that and found that. And then let's go to June. Where they do uh, x-ray of the chest and oh, what, what do we find here? Up, oh, commutated, acute left uh, fifth rib fracture, deformity of third rib. So in the span of a month, I break two ribs and then two more ribs. And then let's not forget about the spine being shattered to glass because in December, new likely acute subacute anterior uh, compression deformity at L1 with approximately 30% of anterior height loss. And then, oh boy, good news. The L2 and L3 that broke earlier, those are okay. So one, two, three, four broken ribs and three broken lumbar uh, sections of my spine. But let's not forget, because I went in because I was having heart issues. And what did they find when they did an x-ray just to double check? Oh, you also have a new faint opacity overlying the right anterior third rib, possibly another healing rib fracture. But, you know, we can't come, we just can't stop there. You know, the rheumatoid arthritis that cripples my hands, the broken ribs, the shattered spine, the heart attacks, the cancer, the loss of hearing, uh, eyesight, loss of sensation in the legs, being bound to a wheelchair. Let's not also forget, you know, wanting to go into probably do surgery for kidney stones. I got lucky on this one. The surgeon was ready to go in. You ever piss out kidney stones when you got a broken back and broken ribs, Mersh? It's super fun. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's, it's fucking tickles me pink. But of course, you know, I just want to just continue on faking it, faking it till I make it, you know, really just, oh, you know, show my daily regimen of pills, try my best to black out things. I'm sure they'll find another oncologist to dox, <laughs> teach the cardiologist a lesson. Now, I bought this off the black market, Mersh, um, because I was so committed to my lie. I was like, I need you to give me 15 different medications that I can show. Um, Berlanta, they always give that to people that make up things. It's such an easy medication to get for your blood thinners. And all the painkillers like the Extamsa and the Oxycodone. Doctors love giving out high-dose, powerful painkillers. It's the one thing they find to be the most enjoyable thing to do. And all the micro or nitro bed and uh, 
you know, nitroglycerin. It's all to keep the lie up. It's all to keep the lie up. You know, and the, and the letters to things like the Undiagnosed Disease Network, uh, where they're trying to get me into research medicine, or the Cleveland Clinic, or the place in Massachusetts. It's just all make-believe. It's all fictitious things in my head. From uh, Gutierrez? Probably, I probably butchered that. Uh, what happened to the crowd diagnosis video? Uh, well, I was going to do that. I could still potentially do it. Uh, but right now, it just seems... I've reached a point where the specialists that I've gone into won't even do treatments. So, uh, case in point, with the osteoporosis and the multiple bone fractures, um, I think I've, in total, maybe seven ribs have broken, and, you know, L1, L2, and L3. Um, and they've got some concerns about my hips now. And so, you know, I was set up to go and see endocrinology and a few others. And I go in to see the doctor. And the consensus among the doctors was, we may not know what you have, but if you go in and see this guy, at the very least for the osteo, we can give you some medicine that'll help slow it down till we can figure it out. I go in to see the osteo guy, and um, he looks through my, my records, he reads over it all, and uh, his conclusion was, I can't do anything. He's like, I can't, I'm not even going to start you on the most basic of medicines that we would give somebody in this situation for two reasons. One, there's too much going on, and I don't understand what this is. It's just too much disease. And two, for your age and the amount of breaks that you're showing, it, it's not even normal for the kind of osteo that you have. So, you know, after seeing specialists and, and seeing that kind of shit and having them basically say, we can't do anything for you at this point, um, talked around to different doctors and the consensus was either, well, two things. One, go to Mayo and get full genome sequencing or exome sequencing, whatever it is through Diagnostic Odyssey. And then the second was go into research medicine. So research medicine like uh, UND, or no, UDN, whatever it is, uh, Cleveland Clinic, and then there's a place out in Massachusetts. It's like this two-month-long process. You've got to get letters of recommendations from your doctors and specialists. You've got to write a letter. You've got to get all your medical records together. And then it's some kind of a thing where you send it in, and it takes them one to two months to look it over and see, do we want to let you into the program or not? You know, are you a fit for it? Uh, so I'm waiting to see how that goes. Uh, if that dead ends, if I don't get in or it dead ends, uh, then fuck it. I'm just going to release... I'll release a video with just all the tests, all the medical shit, and maybe somebody out there is a savant and they can figure it out because it's baffled everybody else. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. It really just makes no fucking sense. Hey guys. So in this video, I want to talk about Mr. Medicare. Now, Mr. Medicare has been sick for like five years or something. And we still don't really know what his his official diagnosis is um the doctors can't seem to figure anything out um some people have called him a liar i don't think he's a liar that's something that some people believe but my personal um opinion my assumption is that he's telling the truth i'm gonna give you my opinion i have come across some information that kind of opened my eyes. I kind of uh, put two and two together when I was listening to uh, the Easter stream recently because, um, you know, when I'm uh, doing yard work or whatever, you know, I put on old old streams from, you know, Kino Casino or whatever. And he was talking about his symptoms and um, it just, it just something clicked, you know, because I had, I had recently read a book by uh, a guy named Weston A. Price. This was a book from the 1930s on the effects of modern diets. And what struck me is that a lot of the symptoms that he was describing, you know, brittle bones, uh, you know, warping bones, uh, pain, headaches, um, vision and hearing problems, you know, and he's got all these kinds of like, unexplained diseases happening all at once like he's got um you know he's got little cancers going on in his chest he's got um coronary art artery disease or whatever you call it and it's it's so complex there's just so many um it seems like there's several diseases going on at once um so you know it's 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 not like um it's not like cancer, you know, it's not like, um, 
is not something that a doctor could easily point to. It's like it's like one thing is causing all of these other things to happen, right? It's it sort of has a domino effect to it, where it's like this one problem is creating you know several different problems, right? And and again, like this has been going on for years. This is like um, this is a very slow process of degeneration. And it's exactly the types of symptoms that I kept hearing about in this book. Now, for those who don't know, Weston A. Price was a Canadian dentist who founded the National Dental Association. And basically what this guy did was he traveled around the world um, looking for a control group, basically, you know, to look at um, people that actually had, you know, perfect teeth, um, that he could study and can say, well, what's the difference between that group and our group, right? The, you know, the people that eat um, modern foods, like what's the difference, right? What's the difference in the diet? Um, you know, what's the difference in, you know, the lifestyle, all that stuff, right? And what he found was that there were significant differences. And he, what he found was, were that these people did in fact have perfect teeth because that was the rumor at the time. The rumor at the time was that um, you know, the, the savages actually had like really good health and, and nobody could really explain why that was. And what he demonstrates over and over and over again, using photographs and experiments and, um, you know, taking measurements, uh, what he, what he demonstrated was that the children of, um, primitive, primitive people, right? The modernized children, um, as soon as they started eating modern foods, they got dental decay, they got bone deformities, they got, um, you know, osteoporosis and soft bones and, um, you know, uh, you know, their faces were much, much narrower. Um, you know, the, the jaws were really underdeveloped. They had all sorts of um, deformities of the arches. Um, they got tuberculosis. They got appendicitis. They got all of these... Um, seemingly irrelevant um diseases you know like that that you wouldn't particularly associate with um with diet right um but this is just what he found and he gives many examples of this i'll read you an excerpt figure 93 this figure shows the rapid healing of a fractured femur of a boy four and one half years of age suffering from convulsions due to malnutrition his fracture occurred when he fell in a convulsion. There was no healing in 60 days. After reinforcing his nutrition with butter vitamins, the healing at the right occurred in 30 days. Whole milk replaced skim milk, and a whole wheat gruel made from freshly ground whole wheat replaced white bread. This is illustrated in the following case. A minister in an industrial section of our city during the period of severe depression telephoned me stating that he had just been called to baptize a dying child. The child was not dead, although almost constantly in convulsions. He thought the condition was probably nutritional and asked if he could bring the boy to the office immediately. The boy was badly emaciated, had rampant tooth decay, one leg in a cast, a very bad bronchial cough, and was in and out of convulsions in rapid succession. His convulsions had been getting worse progressively during the past eight months. His leg had been fractured two or three months previously while walking across the room when he fell in one of his convulsions. Sound uh, a bit familiar, Jim? No healing had occurred. His diet consisted of white bread and skimmed milk. For mending the fracture, the boy needed minerals, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. His convulsions were due to a low calcium content of the blood. All of these were in the skim milk for the butter fat removed in the cream contains no calcium nor phosphorus except traces. The program provided was a change from the white flour bread to wheat gruel made from freshly ground wheat and the substitution of whole milk for skim milk with the addition of about a teaspoonful of a very high vitamin butter with each feeding. He was given this meal that evening when he returned to his home. He slept all night without a convulsion. He was fed the same food five times the next day and did not have a convulsion. He proceeded rapidly to regain his health without recurrence of his convulsions. In a month, the fracture was united. 
Two views of the fracture are shown in figure 93, one before and one after the treatment. Six weeks after this nutritional program was started, the preacher called at the home to see how the boy was getting along. His mother stated that the boy was playing about the doorstep, but they could not see him. She called but received no answer. Presently, they spied him where he had climbed up the downspout of the house to the second story. On being scolded by his mother, he ran and jumped over the garden fence, thus demonstrating that he was pretty much of a normal boy. This boy's imperative need that was not provided in white bread and skim milk was the presence of the vitamins and other activators that are in whole milk but not in skim milk and in whole wheat, freshly ground, but not in white flour. He was restored to health by the simple process of having nature's natural foods restored to him. This process of borrowing from the skeleton in times of stress may soften the bones so that they will be badly distorted. This is frequently seen as bow legs. An illustration of an extreme condition of bone softening by this process is shown in figure 94, lower section, which is the skeleton of a monkey that was a house pet. It became very fond of sweets and was fed on white bread, sweetened jams, etc. as it ate at the same table with its mistress. Note that the bones became so soft that the pull of the muscles distorted them into all sorts of curves. Naturally, its body and legs were seriously distorted. In this condition, my patient, whom I was serving professionally, asked me for advice regarding her monkey's deformed legs and distorted body. I suggested an improved nutrition and provided fat-soluble vitamins consisting of a mixture of a high vitamin butter oil and high vitamin cod liver oil, with the result that minerals were deposited on the borders of the vertebrae and joints and on the surfaces of the bones as shown in the illustration. This, of course, could not correct the deformity and the animal was chloroformed. And here's a picture of the monkey. Of course, I really recommend reading the entire book because they're just example after example after example. It also goes into, you know, all the all the case studies of different tribes all over the world. Um, it, was, it was a very, very extensive book. I don't know what Mr. Medicare's diet is. I suspect it's, you know, kind of, a, you know, standard American diet, which is to say a mixed diet. You know, some meat, some processed food, some bread, some vegetables, salad, soup, whatever. And you would think that would be fine, right? You would think that would be completely fine. But some humans, some humans are just not evolved for this modern technological society. They're not, they're not evolved, um, to live in this civilization, okay? There are some humans who have a, a vestigial psychology. You know, I would, I would consider autism to be a vestigial psychology. And they're just, in general, like people that they can't function, um, they, they have no economic potential, they can't follow laws, and they also can't, like, eat the foods. They can't, like, they can't drink milk, they can't... Um, they get all sorts of health problems. They um, they just physically degenerate, right? A good example of this, in in my personal opinion, would be like Native Americans. I mean, they're just such a, to me at least, they're such a maladapted group. I mean, you look at them; they live in trailer parks. They have um, just garbage all over the over the fucking lawn. They're all drunks. They, they steal all the funds that they get from the government. They make meth labs in the houses, and then the houses have to be boarded up. They can't be used. And as Price demonstrates, like, I mean, these people just got really bad health from these, these modern foods. And, you know, I think it's very possible that Jim is on the autism spectrum. Now, I'm on the spectrum myself, and when you study autism from the perspective that's vestigial psychology... Um, you notice a lot of things like you notice, you know, um, that you have dry skin for some reason, right? You have this dry skin on the back of your hands and, you know, you have um, dandruff or whatever. You also have um, collecting habits, right? You, you, you get addicted to collecting, right? If you notice um, Mr. Medicare, he collects manga. He has a very, very large collection of manga and he's very um, particular about you know, the way that he collects it. Um, he also apparently builds models, right? He builds like um, 
you know, anime robot models or something like that. I mean, that's that's autistic, right? That's 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 hunter gatherer stuff, right? I recommend uh, Artos.net. There's a researcher named uh, Leif Ekblad who has written extensively about autism as some sort of vestigial psychology, although he he connects it directly to Neanderthals. I, I personally am ambivalent about that. I know Bill Gady has a theory that, that, you know, humans did not interbreed with Neanderthals, but but I digress. And and remember, you know, I don't really know Jim, so I can't really speak to him as having autism, but the fact that it's possible that he could have some sort of uh, nutritional problem, um, that's an indication that he's very sensitive to, to civilizational pressures, um, and therefore he could be autistic, right? Because those... I mean, that's that's what autism is. Autism is just hunter-gatherer brain. And that's why it's associated with all sorts of, like, weird fetishes and um, just um, inexplicable behavior, but not necessarily, like, um, non-functioning behavior. It's, like, um, it's less social, but it, it, there, there's some advantages to it, if you know what I mean. Like, for example, uh, people with autism actually have greater um, eyesight in the dark. They have an easier time keeping consistent and logical arguments that they're not really fooled by you know um you know like uh demagoguery right you know what happened from my perspective what happened was that um we used to live in tribes and then there was there were some humans that were very susceptible to joining cults right and those cults became the first states, right? And those states obviously outcompeted all of these these little tiny tribes and stuff. And so um, autism was basically just like bred out of existence. And nowadays it's just some sort of um, vestigial remnant that that gets expressed through through you know bad DNA. So if you're curious if you have autism, you could also like look back and see like, well, you know, when I was born, did my mother have like a C-section? Um, do I have anything that's like associated with like, you know, mental illness or deformity, for example, like left-handedness, I'm left-handed. Um, I was born from a C-section. My, my mom had like the, uh, uh the, the tube was like around my neck or something. They had to, they had to pull me out some, some other way. There's also the fact that I got appendicitis. So, that could be genetic, right? That could also be, <laughs> again, nutrition. It could be that I'm sensitive to to modern foods, and so I, I developed this bacterial problem in my appendix. But uh, yeah, allergies and all kinds of weird, inexplicable things that you don't know how to fix. Like it's probably because you're you're sensitive to this unnatural environment that that we now live in. And you also have to consider the fact that Jim is Irish. And this is a little controversial, but, you know, I'm partially Irish, so I can say this. I can, I'm not racist for saying this, but, you know, Irish people are kind of, you know, uncivilized, right? They didn't really have any civilization before the British came and gave it to them, basically. I mean, you can, I mean, take a look at this excerpt, for example. Gerald of Wales accompanied King Henry's son John on his 1185 trip to Ireland. As a result of this, he wrote Topographia Hibernica, which means Topography of Ireland, and Expugnatio Hibernia, which means Conquest of Ireland, both of which remained in circulation for centuries afterwards. Ireland, in his view, was rich, but the Irish were backward and lazy. They use their fields mostly for pasture. Little is cultivated and even less is sown. The problem here is not the quality of the soil, but rather the lack of industry on the part of those who should cultivate it. This laziness means that the different types of minerals with which hidden veins of the earth are full are neither mined nor exploited in any way. They do not devote themselves to the manufacture of flax or wool, nor to the practice of any mechanical or mercantile act. Dedicated only to leisure and laziness, this is a truly barbarous people. They depend on animals for their livelihood, and they live like animals. 
Gerald's views were not atypical, and similar views may be found in the writings of William of Malmesbury and William of Newburgh. When it comes to Irish marital and sexual customs, Gerald is even more biting. This is a filthy people wallowing in vice. They indulge in incest, for example, in marrying, or rather debauching, the wives of their dead brothers. Even earlier than this, Archbishop Anselm accused the Irish of wife-swapping, exchanging their wives as freely as other men exchange their horses. And yeah, that is a pretty racist uh, description, I guess, but... You know, I'm a white nationalist, so I don't really care. Yeah, laziness, uh, frivolity. I mean, these things are these things are considered bad in our our civilization. But that's only because we live in a civilization, and so there's there's kind of a bias there, right? I mean, what animal in nature values hard work? I mean, have you ever seen a, a lion do a push up? No, they're, they're lazy. They, they sit around all day. Okay, and you, you might you might think that they're really efficient. No, 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 they are not efficient. Okay, they they are always on their asses or just like wandering in a in a random direction for no reason, and then they just stop and they just look around and like doing nothing. Right. <laughs> I mean, a good example of this is uh, autistic inertia. Now, this is something that I I suffer with, and it's it's really excruciating it's kind of like uh like imagine you want to start your car and when you change levers right to to, to you know get out of bed or or do something or whatever it's like you, you keep pre you keep turning the key you keep changing the the lever and nothing happens and this is because we we have this innocuous assumption uh that that we are in total control of our own bodies, right? Uh, actually, this is not true. Some humans have more control over their bodies than others, right? Some humans, especially uh, autistic, you know, primitive-minded people, right? They have um, they have a subconscious that literally forces them to rest, right, and to only act in you know the most pressing of circumstances. This is why, like, when you put a a, a cricket in a cage with a lizard it's like the lizard doesn't do anything like the lizard just stares into space doing nothing and then just like randomly it just like turns and it sees the cricket and just stare it just stares at it for another three minutes and then randomly it just decides to act and that's because the lizard's brain is forcing it to rest and to only act in the most pressing of circumstances okay so that's that's what autistic inertia is it's like your brain it's literally forcing you because that's in nature that's like the most efficient way of doing things is only act when you need to not not waste not not waste energy just because you had a, an interesting thought or something right and yeah like evolution is not just something that we see over billions and trillions of years evolution is very very subtle and humans just like all animals they're they're complex systems right and so when you add complexity to these systems they they start to break in all sorts of unexpected ways and often ways that you can't see you know and this is what's um at the heart of this this divide between um you know liberals and and reactionaries it's like we're we're arguing over things that we can't really see, right? For example, homosexuality. Like, why is that? Uh, why is that a bad thing? Like, why do people hate homosexuals? Well, it's for reasons that we can't really see. It's for reasons that we we aren't aware of. It's more like we've just sort of evolved to dislike those things through a process of trial and error, whatever those things are, right? Um, and it's interesting because then. You know, people practice homosexuality and then they quite literally genocide themselves with AIDS. But I digress. Evolution is a basic principle of existence, right? It's the, the objects that stay, stay, and the objects that disappear, disappear, right? You know, you see the evolution of uh, physical objects, right? The manufacture of chairs and how chairs evolve over time or how ideas um you know, select for certain traits and how ideas evolve over time, like 
communism and Christianity, stuff like that. So there's all, all kinds of subtle things that are going on that we're, we're not even privy to. I mean, and this process happens very fast. This happens very fast. And you can see it with uh, the Bellier farm fox experiment where like six generations into the experiment, the foxes became domesticated. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy that that happened. Six generations? Are you kidding me? You take um, just some just some wild animals, and in six generations, you turn them into house pets. That's crazy, right? And there's all kinds of... And that experiment was so fascinating because it's like... Um, the foxes got all sorts of weird coloration, like dog-like you know, spl splotches and stuff on their bodies, and they got floppy ears, and uh, I believe they even started uh, barking. So, um, yeah, like, there's all sorts of weird stuff that's been papered over that we don't even know about, right? And, um, and so people should have, you know, more of an open mind about this stuff, right? That, that evolution actually does have a very strong influence on the way that we live and the in, in our and our health within this this civilization right now does that mean that my my theory here is correct no it doesn't doesn't mean that at all i mean i'm not a doctor i don't uh i never went to school or studied any like medical books you know but you never know i mean uh maybe jim will decide to pick up this book and uh maybe something will, will click for him uh, he could take a look at uh, the Weston A. Price Foundation. He can take a look at uh, the, the the lecture series that's on that's on YouTube. Um, you can also take a look at Dr. Anthony Chaffee's lecture, which is called "Plants Are Trying to Kill You." I think it has some really interesting insights into the the natural defenses of plants, right? And maybe maybe um, some negative effects that it has on the human body, but. Um, I would really like to know what Medecker's diet is and what it was before he got sick. And I would also like to know how he scores on various autism tests, including the autism quotient, uh, the Aspie quiz that's on Ardos.net. That's a really interesting one because that goes into like very, very specific behaviors. It's, it's way more comprehensive than the um, autism quotient, at least in, at least in my opinion. I mean, you gotta remember, I'm not. I don't really have an authoritative view of knowledge, and I also don't operate off of the scientific method. I operate off of a different scientific method by Bill Gatey. Um, so take everything that I say here with a with a grain of salt, and don't uh, don't don't just immediately start eating like raw meat or some something crazy like that. Anyways, Jim, I'm really sorry that this is happening to you. I'm really sorry for your wife. I'm really sorry for your family. I really hope that you can find a way out of this. Otherwise, thanks for all the content, man. It's been a really good ride, you know, and uh, we won't forget you, man. You're a legend.